So, we're live. All right. Thank you for those of you that reminded us that the, I need a long stick where I can... Humility. Uh, something we like to see in other people, but don't necessarily want to work too hard at developing uh, in ourselves. And, and I would argue that humility is really underneath the two attitudes that we've looked at so far. The proud person says, I don't need to listen to God. The humble person says, I want to know what God says. I will hear what God the Lord will speak. They have a hunger to hear God. And the proud heart says, I will hope in what I can do or what people can do, but the humble in heart say, no, I need to hope in what God can do, because man cannot do what God can do. Man will fail. Uh, God cannot. We are in his hands, and he is in control. And then uh, we saw in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen a verse many of us are familiar with, uh, on revival, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. God wants us to humble ourselves. We are to humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways. Yeah. And then will he hear from heaven and will forgive our sin and will heal our land. God wants us to humble ourselves. And, and humility is a thread that goes throughout the Bible. Certainly not one place where you can go. There's multiple places. And uh, there is so much that I'm just I'm, I'm trying to break it down into bite size, for lack of a better word, chunks, and focus on different aspects of, of humility. Uh, last week we looked at humility's view of sin, or what the humble person, what their view of sin is. And uh, the humble person has a sorrow for sin. Pride enjoys sin. Pride doesn't think sin is bad. Uh, but humility has a sorrow for sin. Uh, humility acknowledges, it recognizes that sin hinders the blessing of God. God wants to bless us. Sometimes we're not blessable. And, and what I mean by that is most of us as parents, uh, grandparents, we don't, you know, root our child or grandchild on when they do wrong. We don't reward them. Keep up the good, horrible job that you're doing of being disobedient to, you know, whatever. We don't do that. Um, God, we, sin hinders the blessing of God. God wants to bless, Amen. but sin hinders that. And so the humble heart recognizes that. Uh, the proud heart thinks God doesn't see sin. God doesn't care about sin. God doesn't hold us accountable for sin. The humble one agrees that sin must be forsaken. It must be turned from not hung on to, and humility asks that sin be pointed out. You know, I, I really, if, if we really knew how harmful sin was to us, I think we would welcome people pointing it out instead of getting defensive. Amen. This morning, so that last week was humility's view of sin. Today I want us to look at humility's view of self. What does the humble person think of themselves? And again, I have in your outline there the quote from uh, E.M. Bounds, uh, humble person, humility is just feeling little because we are little. Humility is realizing our unworthiness because we are unworthy. The feeling and declaring ourselves sinners because we are sinners. Humility is not a false beating yourself up. It's a agreeing with God who you are in the sight of God. And that's what we're going to look at. What does uh, the Bible have to say about uh, the, the humble person? How do they look at themselves? And, and that's what we're going to uh, look at this morning. Let's pray again. Father, we thank you again uh, for this time. Again, we thank you that you know hearts. Again, we thank you. Uh, for your word. Uh, Lord, it's pretty safe to say uh, if men wrote your word, they would not promote humility. Uh, they would promote pride uh, because that's who we are in our nature. And Lord, we thank you for your grace. Uh, we thank you for your goodness in giving us your son. 
Uh, we thank you for your goodness and giving us your word. And again, I just ask that uh, we would put aside uh, the cares of our life right now, the plans of our day right now, and that we would just focus on what you say, uh, not just with our ears, but what you say to our hearts and what you want us to do with what we hear. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So how does the humble person view himself? God's Word tells us, number one, that humility views self as unworthy. Views self as unworthy. Unworthy of what? Not unworthy of breathing or food or clothing, but unworthy of letter A, of forgiveness and mercy from God. I want you to take your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 15, a very familiar uh, account, prodigal son. Uh, if you're using a pew Bible, it's page 767. It, I, I would encourage you to do that, 767. Uh, Luke chapter 15, uh, the humble person sees they are unworthy of the forgiveness and mercy from God. And the first sub-point there, the example of the prodigal son. Uh, we're going to be moving around a little bit this morning, so we're not going to dig too deep into any one passage. But Luke 15, verse number 11, we have the introduction to the parable. And of course, uh, if you have a red letter edition of the Bible, you can see it's something that Jesus spoke. And uh, he gave this parable and he said, a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divideth unto them his living. So basically, he wanted his inheritance before his father passed away. He wanted a, you know, a, he, he wanted it paid ahead. He wanted it now so he could use it now. And his father did that. And verse 13 says that not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, everything that he had been given, took his journey to a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. He got hungry. He got so hungry that he wanted to eat the food that he was feeding pigs. He couldn't find a job. All the friends that he had helped out left him when, he came, when it came time for him to have needs. And so he's hungry, he's feeding pigs, he wants to eat their food, and then he has a light bulb moment. Uh, he, he says in verse 17, and when he came to himself, boy, uh, Thankfully, many of us have been there, right? Came to himself, came to his senses. God convicted us. God woke us up. God shook us up, whatever you want to call it. He came to himself and he said, how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough to spare? And I perished with hunger. And then he says to himself, it is not wrong to talk to yourself. It is good to talk to yourself sometimes, especially when you are telling yourself to do the right thing. He says, I will arise. And I will go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, notice verse 19, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. He understood that he did not deserve to be called a son. He did not deserve mercy from his father. He was going to go home and beg to be a servant. Awesome picture, and you know this. This is a picture of a sinner coming to God. This is a picture of a sinner realizing, I have sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. I am not worthy of heaven. I'm not worthy of forgiveness. He wanted mercy. And he got home, and he got mercy. God gave him mercy. The, the picture, the father uh, was waiting for him and threw his arms around him and hugged him and kissed him and they had a feast. And he, he welcomed him home, welcomed him into the family. God does that to us. We have another familiar, very vivid picture. Uh, Luke 18, just a few pages more to the back of the Bible, 770 yeah. uh, in the Pew Bible, Luke chapter 18. We have the example of the Pharisee and the publican. Uh, Luke chapter 18, verse 9. Luke tells us why Jesus gave this parable. He spells it right out. Verse 9, He spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Very plainly says, Jesus told this because there are certain groups of people and certain individuals that think in themselves, they are righteous. They are right with God. They have it all together. And 
they despised others. And so Jesus told this parable to correct their thinking. Verse 10, two men went up to pray. Pharisee is a religious man. Outwardly, he was the churchgoer. He was the big money giver. He was the prayer. He was the guy that outward you would say, wow, that guy fears and loves God. But his heart was far from God. And we see the publican was a tax collector. He was despised. He was, he was considered the sinner of the land. And verse number 11 and 12, we see the Pharisee. I like what one commentator said. Uh, Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. He didn't pray to God because he was only about himself. But he went on to tell God how good he was and how he belonged in heaven because he was good and he certainly wasn't like this other guy over here, this publican. The publican, verse 13, standing afar off, he didn't come up front. He hung out in the back, he stood in the back, wouldn't even hardly lift his head up. He was so aware of his sin and who God was. And he would not lift his eyes up to heaven. He smote upon his breast. He beat on his chest and he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The proud man tells God all the good he does. The humble man says, I got nothing good. I need mercy. Be merciful to me. And then Jesus to make sure we cannot miss it, very plainly tells you his view on the two men. Verse 14, I tell you, this man, the last one, the one who spoke last, this man, the one who said, God be merciful to me, a sinner, this man went down to his house justified. He went home right with God he ultimately would end up in heaven as well. He was right with God. He was right with God because he asked for mercy, uh, not the other man. The other man who thought he was good, the other man who didn't need God, the other man who told God why God should let him into heaven, uh, he would not, he did not go home justified. He did not, he thought he was right with God. He did not go home right with God. And he eventually, if he did not repent, there would come a day when he would meet Jesus Christ and Christ would say, depart from me, I never knew you. The humble person recognizes they need mercy and they need forgiveness. We are not, thankfully, just pardoned criminals, are we? We come to God and we don't just escape hell. He gives us the wonderful privilege and blessing of being children. You know, we're, we're not pardoned criminals that are on probation. We are elevated to being made children of God. And so the humble person uh, sees themselves as unworthy of having forgiveness and ha of having mercy. And they also see themselves as unworthy of blessing, that letter B, uh, of blessing and kindness from God. I want you to turn now to 1 Chronicles chapter 17. So way in the front of the Bible, uh, Old Testament, page 340. If you're using a pew Bible, page 340. 1 Chronicles 17. We spent some time in Chronicles last week. Uh, 1 Chronicles 17. And we're looking at the life of David. First Chronicles 17. Again, page 340. Verse number one. It came to pass as David sat in his house and David said to Nathan the prophet, Lo, I dwell in a house of cedars, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord remaineth under curtains. In other words, David says to this prophet, I live in a beautiful house, and God lives in a tent. I want to do something about that. I want to make God a house. And that was a good desire. But that wasn't the plan. Verse number four came to pass the same night that the word of God came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell David, 
Thus saith the Lord, thou shalt not build me a house to build in, uh, to dwell in. God said, you know what, that's a good desire, David, but David, you are not going to build the house. Uh, skip down to verse number 11. Verse number 11. And it shall come to pass, so God has a message for David. And it shall come to pass, when thy days be expired, that thou must go to be with thy fathers, that I will raise up thy seed after thee, which shall be of thy sons, and I will establish his kingdom, and he shall build me a house. So God says, David, that's a noble desire. But you aren't going to build me a house. Your seed, one of your offspring, one of your sons, is going to build me a house instead. And I'm going to establish his kingdom, Verse end of verse number 11. And then verse number 12 He's going to build me a house and I will establish his throne forever. I will establish his throne forever. And what's going on here is Solomon would be the temple builder, but Jesus Christ would be the kingdom liver, the kingdom ruler. And Jesus Christ would someday sit on the throne forever. You know, we've been talking uh, Wednesday nights about the millennial kingdom and Jesus Christ is going to sit on a literal throne in literal Jerusalem on this literal earth that we see. He will sit king for a thousand years and this verse is a, is a prophecy about that. And so David gets this news and then verse 16 and David the king came and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is mine house that thou hast brought me hitherto? What is my house? See, I am a poor, I, I am from a poor, insignificant family in Israel, and you are making me a king. You have made me a king. And you have not only made me a king, but you have said my throne is going to be established for a while. And I, I wonder if sometimes we do this. We should do this. David came and sat before God and was amazed that God made him a king. Do we come and sit before God? Do we sit in our chair? Do we sit on our couch? Do we sit on our rocking chair on the front porch when it's nice out, do we just look up at the sky, look at the stars, look at the sunset, and say, who am I that you made me a child of yours? David was amazed at God's goodness. And then verse 17, And yet this was a small thing in thine eyes, O God, for thou hast also spoken of thy servant's house for a great while to come, and has regarded me according to the state of a man of high degree. I know there's a lot there, but David said, you haven't just made me king. You have said that my name and my lineage is going to last for a long time. Let's think about this. David wrote this approximately 1000 BC. 3000 years later, we are still talking about David, a man after God's own heart. And we're talking today about his humility and his awe and his wonder over the blessing of God taking a shepherd boy and making him king. And if, if we, that it, our privilege of being sinners and enemies of God and being made priests with him, sons of his, and will someday rule and reign with him and be with him forever in heaven, our awe over the blessing and kindness of God should be equally great. Amen. Humble person, how do they view themselves? They're unworthy of forgiveness and mercy and worthy of the blessing and kindness of God. Secondly, humility views self as unwise. Humility recognizes that in and of themselves they lack wisdom. They are unwise. First, an example, letter A, example of humility, desiring wisdom. 
Uh, we're in First Chronicles. Turn back towards the front of your Bibles to First Kings. Uh, Pew Bible, 276, page 276, First Kings chapter 3. First Kings chapter 3, beginning with verse number 5. And so we're leaving David, we're coming to Solomon. First Kings chapter 3, uh, verse 5. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. Don't misunderstand me. God is not your genie in a bottle that you rub when you need help. He is not. But in this instance, he came to Solomon and said, not what are your three wishes, but said, what, what do you want me to give you? You know, you think of the possibilities. We actually have some. In verse 11, God said, because thou hast asked this thing and not asked for long life, he could have asked for long life, he could have asked for riches, he could have asked for the defeat of all his enemies so that his kingdom would be in peace forever. Solomon didn't ask for that. Any king would want that, wouldn't he? Long life, riches, and all your enemies to be defeated? What, kind of, what king wouldn't want that? Verse number 7. God gives him this. Solomon says, verse 6, and then he, he continues on. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father. And I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. He was not a little child in age. He was at least 20. He was at least 20, possibly 25. But he said, I'm but a little child. He says, I know not how to go out or come in. The idea here, Clark wrote, uh, I am just like an infant learning how to walk, and I need help walking. And so that was his attitude. I don't know how to do this king stuff. Don't miss the fact that he also said, Lord, my God, and I am your servant. He was humble. God was his God. He was God's servant. He did not know how to do king stuff. Verse 8. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen. A great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. You made me a king over this incredibly large amount of people. But I don't think there was just an awe over how big the kingdom was and how many people he was over. There was an awe over the responsibility of, I am to be the leader of people that God chose for himself. And he recognized that he was not equal to that task. Amen. He understood that based on the responsibility that he had, that there was no way he could do this. He needed help. And here's the help that he asked for, verse 9. Give, therefore, thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this, thy so great a people. He asked for an understanding heart. He asked for wisdom because this job, this responsibility is way over his head. He knew there would be times that he would have no idea what to do. He knew there would be times that it would be hard to tell what the right thing was to do and what the best thing was to do. Isn't that true of us? Isn't that true of us? We don't always know what to do. We don't know advice to give to people. 
We don't always know how to comfort someone. We don't know how to counsel someone. We don't know what we should do or not do. We, should know what we, sh we don't know what to say or not say or just zip the lip all together. We don't, there are times we don't even know how to pray. Thankfully, the Holy Spirit helps us. We should be like Solomon and ask God for wisdom. Verse number 10 reminds us the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. God is pleased with us when we humbly come to him and say, I lack wisdom. I need you to give me wisdom in this situation. We have Solomon's example of humility, wanting wisdom, and then we see God exhorts us. God commands us uh, to look to him. Let her be. Exhortations from God to look to him for wisdom. God tells us to look to him for wisdom. It's not surprising that God would use Solomon, the man that he gave wisdom to, to write the book of wisdom. Proverbs. Go on, the book you're going through in an adult Sunday school class. Proverbs 2. Notice the desire that we are, as, as we read these verses on your outline there, uh, Proverbs 2, 3 through 6, notice the, the desire, the seeking that there should be. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice for understanding, pray, if thou seek her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures, we need to cry, we need to pray, we need to seek, we need to search. Then, when we do that, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. And Solomon certainly could vouch for that, couldn't he? He, got, he asked God for that, God gave that to him. He wrote about that. And then James 1.5 reminds us of uh, that God wants to seek Look to him for wisdom as well. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not and it shall be given him. God does not scold us. God does not reproach us for asking him for wisdom. He gives it liberally. He gives us it abundantly. He wants us to ask for wisdom. How about us? Do we sense our need for wisdom? Do we look to God for it? You know what? We're not kings over God's people. But we are parents or grandparents or uncle or aunt. Uh, we have neighbors. We have people we know that look at us as friends. We have the Solomon asked for wisdom because of the responsibility he had that God had given him. We have responsibilities that God gives us. We lack wisdom as well, and we need to go to God. Uh, it, how needy, how needful it is for us to recognize that we lack wisdom. We don't know what we should do, and so we need to go to God for that. How does a humble person see himself? sees himself unworthy of God's forgiveness and mercy, unworthy of the blessings of God, unwise in himself. And letter number three, humility views self as unpowerful. Yes, I did it. I got three unwords, unworthy, unwise, unpowerful. But unpowerful is a word. I looked it up in the dictionary. You know what it means? Brace yourself. Not powerful. That's what it means. Unpowerful, not powerful. The proud doesn't like to be weak or thought of as weak, but the humble person accepts weakness as a reality. The proud person doesn't like to admit they can't do something. The humble person admits there are things they can't do. The proud person digs in and tries harder. The humble person gives in and looks to God sooner. Speaking of digging in, I was working on a, uh, we lived up in Spencer, I was working on a, 
a front step project. I was putting, I was building steps out of wood and I was going to put four by four posts in and uh, I was digging the pole or the holes by hand and uh, Abigail was probably seven or eight, uh, maybe six, I don't know. Um, she had not learned the secret that her older brother is new. If you hang around with dad when he's working, you will be put to work. So they, they already got that down. They were, the two boys were out playing, uh, but Abby's there and she's watching me dig and she's like, dad, can I try? And I'm like, my thought is, she can't even lift the shovel. How is she going to put the shovel in the hole and put dirt in it and actually pull the shovel back out? And I said, sure. Gave her the shovel, put it in, got a little dirt in. I can't, Dad, you do it. It didn't take her long at all to realize that she had met her match. She did not have the power to do that job. Too many of us, men especially, or maybe just me, uh, are so slow to get to that point. I can't do it. I need help. We don't ask for directions, right? Or help, for that matter. <laughs> Uh, we don't like to admit we can't do something. We don't like to acknowledge that the situation is too much for us and too often times we are too proud to ask for help, even from God. I'm slowly, and I mean really slowly, learning that it is good to be overwhelmed by the things that I have to do. My wife will vouch for me. There are times that I will lament. And there are times that I will even be crabby because I am overwhelmed with all the things that I have to do or think I should do. But I'm slowly learning that's where God wants me, not dependent on me. Amen. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a doer. You know, we have this thing at uh, different armories, different workplaces will have this. After all is said and done, more will be said than done, right? Okay, well, I'm, I'm the doner, I'm the doer. I want to get things done. And so when a doer and a hard worker and someone who's not smart enough to give up when he should, uh, it's it, to know my own limits. Instead of, you know, I, it I, I tend to try harder and work longer instead of saying, I can't do this. God, help me do this. God, show me what it is that you want me to do in all these things that I have to do. And God delights in putting us in those spots so that we are dependent on him. I have on your, uh, on your outline there, and we're almost done, uh, a verse I've mentioned a couple times, uh, 2 Chronicles 20, Verse 12, uh, and just the way a, a quick background, the king of Judah by the name of Jehoshaphat, uh, he had been informed that Moab and Ammon, two armies were coming against him. Uh, and then Jehosh Jehoshaphat uh, has this, he, he gets this news and he prays. And at the end of the prayer, he says this, for we have no might against this great company, neither or this great company that cometh against us, neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. We don't like to be in that spot. But I'm becoming at least more and more convinced, at least for me, that God wants to put me in those spots because that's my problem. I try to fix my own things. I don't recognize how unpowerful I am at times, and so God keeps on trying to trying to teach me the same lesson that I'm slowly learning. And that's, I have no might to do these things. I do not know what to do. But faith says, our eyes are upon you. Paul reminds us of that same truth. I have on your outline there, 2 Chronicles 12, verse 9, And he, God, said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. God says, my strength is made perfect in weakness. When you are weak, 
then my strength takes over and my strength is complete. My strength will be what lifts you up. And then the end of the verse, Paul says, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. I will rejoice in my being weak because the power of Christ then rests upon me, then helps me. I will rejoice because that's when, in my weaknesses, because that when is when Christ helps. And we have that uh, verse, I think well, Ron likes to quote this one, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ. Not through you. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. So, how does the humble person view themselves? Number one, they see themselves unworthy of forgiveness in heaven. And come to God asking for mercy. The humble person sees themselves as unwise, lacking wisdom, and they go to God and ask Him. And they see themselves as unpowerful, as helpless, as unable to handle the tasks and trials that come their way. And so they come to God, the all-powerful one, for that help. God delights in giving us the grace that we need and uh, Grace and help in time of need and that his grace is sufficient. So how about you? Are you humble? Are you proud? You're one or the other. Uh, we can have God's assistance when we are humble. We have God's resistance when we are proud. God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. If we have God's resistance, it does not go well for us. Uh, God wins. And so uh, this is a need that, that we all have to, to recognize. Uh, humility has the right view of ourselves. Do we have the right view of ourselves? Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for this time. Uh, we thank you for uh, your word pointing things out to us that we don't necessarily like to hear. We like to be thought of as worthy. We like to be thought of as wise in our own eyes. We like to be thought of as doers and powerful and able to make things happen uh, in our own strength. Uh, we thank you for your goodness, though, in pointing out that you are God and we are not. That we are unworthy of heaven, but in mercy you provided a way for us. Uh, you offer us wisdom if we would but admit we need it and seek it from you. You offer to us strength and power and your help if we would but admit that we don't have it. That we have no might against this problem or trial or circumstance in our life. We don't know what to do, and yet our eyes are upon you, and I pray that that would be uh, our heartbeat. And again, Lord, we uh, just thank you for your goodness in pointing these things out to us, and I pray in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Uh, just before we sing an invitation hymn, what would, what would God have us consider? Number one, are you saved? Are you a child of God? The humble person says, I do not deserve heaven. There is sin in my life that I must pay for. I will be separated from God. I need God's mercy. The humble person comes to God and says, Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. I need mercy. Have you, has there been a time, the proud person says, like the Pharisee, Look what I did, God. Let me into heaven. We know which one gets to heaven. We know which one does not. And so has there been a time in your life that you've come to Christ? and said, I ask for your mercy, God, for your forgiveness. Child of God, if you are a child of God, I will. I, you started out humble. Can't come to God without humility. You started out humble. Are you still humble? You know, it's interesting and sad how many people in the Bible start out humble and don't end up that way. Solomon, classic example, started out humble, didn't end up that way, became proud. 
Do you lack wisdom? Ask of God. Do you lack power? Ask of God. Do you sense your own worthiness? Thank God for his goodness. God wants us to depend on him. Nothing between uh, 501 and your hymnals invites you to stand. Uh, 501.